Hello there and welcome back. In this video I'd like to talk about color structural analysis. Now color structural analysis, what's that? It's a method that allows you to study collocations inside a grammatical construction. There are two parts to this video. In the first part I'll talk about what color structural analysis actually is, how it works, the kinds of phenomena that you can study with it, and the kind of theoretical thinking uh, on which it is based. Then in the second part we'll walk through the actual steps of running a colostructional analysis with the help of a concordancer such as AntConc and a spreadsheet software such as Excel. Now this is meant to be a beginner's guide to colostructional analysis. If you've never run a colostructional analysis before this video is for you. All the materials that you need are available if you click on the links in the description below. So you can download those materials and you can carry out the analytical steps along with me as we go through the video. All right, so with that in mind, let's go. What's collastructional analysis? In earlier videos, I have talked about collocational measures such as mutual information or log likelihood or delta p. And those measures allow you to study words that are mutually associated. So for example, the words send and shivers, are they mutually associated? Do they like each other? Uh, if we look in a corpus for the word combination send shivers, do we find it more often than we would expect, less often than we would expect? Those are the kinds of questions that collocational measures allow you to figure out. Constructional analysis does something very similar. It allows you to answer the question, which words are attracted to a given grammatical construction? So for example, in English, we have the be going to construction. The be going to construction occurs with any verb in the English language. So I am going to meet my friends. We're going to have lots of fun. We're going to drink everything we can. Yeah. So the verbs meet, have, drink, they can all occur with be going to. But are those verbs especially attracted to be going to? Do they occur more often than we would expect? That is something that collastructional analysis can help you figure out. So whereas ordinary collocational measures just study the relations between two independent words, collastructional analysis studies the relations between a construction on the one hand and a lexical item that occurs inside that construction. Right, so basically then, uh, collastructional analysis works just like collocation measures, where uh, we have a contingency table with uh, certain pieces of information. You've seen this table before in the earlier videos. So uh, if we study, for example, the collocation of course, we have to find out how often do we find the combination of off and course, how often do we find course on its own, how often do we find off on its own, and how many words or word combinations are in the corpus as a whole. Okay, and based on these figures, we can apply different collocation measures and compute um, values of those collocation measures for off course. Collastructional analysis does something that's very similar. You see that the contingency table looks almost the same, except that in the rows, we don't have a word, but we have a construction because now we're looking not at the co-occurrence of one word with another word, but rather we're looking at the co-occurrence frequency of a word with a construction. Right. So this means that in the red cell, we would have the co-occurrence frequency of our word and our construction. How often do we find, for example, the verb see in the be going to construction? <clears throat> then the green cell describes how often we find that word, not in the construction, but everywhere in the corpus. Yeah. We also need to look for the blue cell, uh, which describes how often we find the construction in a corpus. And then the purple cell, you remember that for the ordinary collocation measures, that cell captured how many words we had in the corpus. Here, it describes something very similar, but not quite the same namely how many constructions we find 
in the corpus. Okay, let's do this with a concrete example that makes things a lot clearer. So let's take uh, the verb see and the be going to construction. Okay, so we're going to see how it works. Um, we have the verb see. <clears throat> And we have the be going to construction and our red cell describes how many examples in the corpus we find for going to see. Yeah? Then the green cell describes how often we find see as a verb in the infinitive form in the corpus. Okay? Uh, things like I will see you soon. Yeah? That would be one example. The blue cell here is the sum total of all be going to constructions in the corpus. Yeah? Going to meet, going to have, going to see, all of them. Finding all of the constructions uh, of a certain type can be tricky. Yeah? So that requires some expertise in how you formulate your search patterns. So um, yeah, we'll talk about that. And then the fourth cell here how many constructions are in the corpus? Well, what are we looking at there? Yeah. So this cell actually has some people seriously confused, but uh, there's no real cause for that. Yeah. So what we're doing here is we're adding up all the infinitives uh, of C plus all the infinitives of verbs that are not C, but have, meet, do, and so on and so forth. So this purple cell is actually the sum total of all infinitive forms that we have in the corpus that we're using. Okay, so that will be the number of all constructions that we have in the corpus. Right, um, what questions can we analyze with this? Well, so for this table, of course, uh, we can compute whether or not be going to and see are mutually attracted, and if so, how strongly. Yeah? We can also apply the same kind of logic, not only to C, but also to all other verbs that occur with the be going to construction in our corpus. So in that sense, we can figure out, well, what other verbs are there that are attracted to be going to? And most importantly, what are the verbs that are most strongly attracted to be going to? So which verbs do we find much more often than we would expect by chance. In order for that to happen, we need to retrieve all examples of be going to. I already said that can be tricky sometimes. Yeah. Um, we need to identify all the verbs that occur with it. And we need to compute a measure of collocational strength for all of them. Yeah. So that means that we have to uh, compute potentially hundreds or thousands of uh, collocational measures. And, um, well, that takes some effort, yeah? Don't worry, though. We'll get through it. At the end of the video, you'll know how it's done. Right, so this video is about how you can do this with AntConc and a spreadsheet software. There are other ways of doing it. So, um, usually people use a software that's called R, and there are scripts for that that you can use. Um, all of that is useful. Yeah, but I think it's also useful to understand the conceptual basics of it, and that is what this video is all about. Okay, so let's take a step back and think about this question. Why should we be interested in construction-specific collocations? Um, the main theoretical motivation for that is the insight that constructions actually have meaning. They're not just meaningless syntactic patterns, but rather they are four meaning pairings. There are symbols that are endowed with meaning. And the meaning of these constructions is reflected, typically, in the lexical items that occur in them. So if we take, for instance, the English ditransitive construction, the most typical verb for that construction is the verb give. Yeah? John gave Mary a cookie. And uh, the meaning of the ditransitive, yeah, it's not coincidental, is the meaning of a transfer, where you have some object that is given to a person by another person. We can also take this example here. I elbowed my way through the crowd, which instantiates the so-called way construction. Yeah? The way construction conveys the meaning of creating a path through difficult terrain, and the verb elbow nicely captures this kind of meaning. So, 
If we analyze the collocational preferences of constructions such as the ditransitive construction or the way construction, we can get an idea of what these constructions actually mean. Yeah, so we have a we have an empirical basis for the semantic description of constructions. So basically then, constructional analysis is a quantitative analytical method that determines the most typical collocates of a construction. And uh, these results then can be used as a basis for a qualitative semantic study. Now, you might say, looking at the most frequent verbs of a construction, that's a very good idea, yeah? Um, but um, why do we need any collocational measures for this? Wouldn't it be enough just to make a list of the most frequent verbs yeah, and uh, take that as a basis. Well, there's actually a problem. Yeah, so raw frequencies. If we just make a frequency list of the most frequent element inside a syntactic frame, um, that sometimes doesn't give us enough information to go on. Um, on this slide, you see two tables with collocate frequencies for. Um, two uh, constructions in English that both encode future time reference, so the modal auxiliary will and the be going to construction. And you see that the most frequent verbs in these two constructions are actually very similar. Yeah? So we have be, have, take, make, and so on and so forth, have, do, and so on. Uh, and they are kind of the same for will and be going to. And so in that sense, just looking at the most frequent elements won't tell you much, or at least it won't tell you enough. Yeah? So sometimes, and actually very often, it's not enough to compare what we would call raw frequencies. We need to find out which lexical elements occur more often than expected with a construction. Um, in an earlier video, I talked about observed frequencies and expected frequencies. So we observe lots and lots of examples with will be. Yeah? But uh, B has a very high frequency to begin with. So is this number really higher than uh, our, the expected frequency that we would calculate for will be? Is it about the same or is it actually lower than uh, the expected frequency of will be. That is what color structural analysis can allow you to figure out. Let me show you a graph that illustrates this logic. So on this slide, you see a corpus that has different words inside it. Okay, the words are represented as X's, Y's, and Z's. Yeah, those are the words that we have in the corpus. And now we retrieve examples of a construction from that corpus. Yeah, so this is our concordance of a construction and uh, we examine the examples and we find that this construction occurs three times with X, three times with Y, and uh, there's one example with Z. Okay, so if we were to base our observations on this concordance only, we would say that X and Y are of the same importance approximately, yeah, because they each occur three times. If we wanted to describe the meaning of the construction, we would say, yeah, so both X and Y are reflecting the constructional meaning that we're after. However, once we look at the frequencies of X and Y in the corpus, a very different picture emerges, yeah? So here you see that X is actually very, very frequent in the corpus, but Y is not. Yeah? So Y would be wildly overrepresented in the construction. So if we're talking about the meaning of the construction, we should pay a lot more attention to Y than to X, because X is just a very frequent element that occurs all through the corpus. Yeah? Okay, so that would be the logic of collastructional analysis. Now, Let's move on to the second part of this video and let's run an actual constructional analysis. There are five steps that we need to accomplish. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, so the first step that we need to do is that we need to extract all examples of a construction from a corpus. We need to run a concordance and we need to pay attention that we really capture all the examples so that we have what's called an exhaustive retrieval of the construction. 
Secondly, we need to identify the frequencies of all lexical collocates in the concordance. So in other words, we have to look at the x's and y's and z's in our uh, construction. And you can imagine if we have a large concordance, that's already a little bit difficult. Yeah? In the third step, we need to identify the overall corpus frequencies of those lexical collocates. So for all the words that we have inside the construction, we also need to find out how often they are used in the corpus, not just in the construction. <clears throat> and then the fourth step is where the statistics comes in. So there we need to apply a statistical test that tells us which lexical elements are most surprisingly frequent in the construction. All right, and once that is done, uh, we can actually uh, move on to the qualitative analysis. We have to inspect the elements that are most strongly attractive. You can also do the opposite. You can look at elements that are most strongly underrepresented or repelled uh, by the construction. Okay, so let's do this. Um, the example construction that I have selected for this exercise is the English split infinitives. All Trekkies out there, yeah, uh, this is what we're going to do to boldly go where no one has gone before, uh, but also to even think or to just sit. Yeah. So the split infinitive is a construction that consists of an infinite marker, two, uh, then an adverb, boldly, even, just, and then a verb in the infinitive. So we're looking at an infinitive construction again. And our question is, are there verbs that are used more often in the split infinitive than would be expected by chance? Yeah. And what can we learn about the split infinitive by looking at those verbs that are overrepresented? Okay, let's jump right in with step number one, running a concordance. Um, if you're my student, open up NCONC and load in the BNCA files. <clears throat> if you're not my student, there's a concordance file that you can use uh, if you click on the link in the description below. Right, um, once you've loaded in the A files, uh, your AntConc interface should look like this. There's one more thing that we need to do. So I want you to go to the settings and the tool preferences. And in the category concordance, I want you to check this checkbox here put delimiter around hits in keyword and context display. Okay, that is something that we need to do. Otherwise, our results files get messier than they need to be. Okay, so once you've done this, click on apply <clears throat> and we're good to go. And I'd like you to search for this scary looking expression here. Okay, before you do though, um, be sure to activate the regex check mark here. And uh, I've increased the search window size to 150 so that I have a bit more context. The sorting is not important, but I have it at first right, second right, third right. You can do the same if you like. And uh, yeah, let me explain what this search pattern is. It looks crazy, but it's really not. Uh, it starts with the tag for the infinitive marker two. Yeah, so that's this, and then the actual word, two, white space, and again, uh, the tag for an adverb, plus this expression here. Um, you actually know what it means. We talked about regular expressions. So in angular brackets, we have A to Z, lowercase letters, several of them. That's what the plus is for. So this will find any adverb with its tag as long as it consists of lowercase letters only, which is what we want here. Yeah. Another white space. And then this tag here, I'm sure you know what it is. Yeah. It describes a lexical verb in the infinitive. And again, in angular brackets, lowercase letters, so that we get all of these verbs that you see here. Yeah. If you click on start, Ancong will start doing its thing. Uh, this may actually take a while since we're working with a 12 million word corpus. So if Ancong is taking too long, you can go to the bathroom or stand up and straighten your shoulders and uh, you'll be ready and motivated for the next step, which is to save the output 
<clears throat> so under file there's an option save output you can click on that and save the concordance on a place on your computer where you will find it um, this is what the txt file looks like yeah so uh, this is what we have created <clears throat> and you see that there are tabs uh, before the search term to clearly display and after the search term which is what we want okay this is important once we import this file into uh, a spreadsheet so if yours looks like this you can actually copy and paste it into a spreadsheet software like Excel and your file should look something like this yeah in the best case scenario there is the example number there is the left context there is the search term the right context and the corpus file so that you know where the example is coming from um, right in case yours doesn't look like this don't worry you just download the file that I provide in the uh, description below okay right but do yourself a favor you know try this out uh, getting from the results to a spreadsheet that looks like this um, one thing that I would recommend is that you make headers for the columns yeah so the example number left context search term right and file <clears throat> um, and this is what we'll be working with in the next steps so this would be the completion of the first thing that we needed to do we needed to extract all examples of a construction from a corpus and we have stored this in a spreadsheet software so that we can go on working with it okay so if you've come if you've made it to this point good work let's move on to the second step we need to get the frequencies of each verb so from our concordance we need to identify all the verb types and count how often they occur now given that our concordance is not that large yeah, we have some 300 examples if you look at your uh, spreadsheet we could technically uh, type up all the verbs that we have here however we are lazy and or we don't have much time so we need to figure out how this can be done automatically um, so I would ask you to highlight this middle column and then copy and paste it into a new sheet in the same uh, spreadsheet software that you're using so you can click on the little plus here in Excel and there's a new sheet that will open up and that's where you dump uh, this search term column right um, once you've accomplished that uh, what you need to do is actually a search and replace and there's exciting news that I can share Excel knows wildcards too we've talked about those so Antcon knows wildcards and Excel knows wildcards too the bad news is that the wildcards that you know in Antcon and the one that you can use in Excel they're not quite the same okay so there are surprises lurking behind every corner which is nice in a way yeah life can be so boring uh, and then you find out that wildcards work differently in Antcon in Excel and that well what a welcome surprise <clears throat> right so what I want you to do is to uh, look for the initial part of the search term yeah so the tag for two and then two white space the tag for the adverb and then instead of the adverb uh, a question mark and a star and a white space okay that you need to look for and replace with nothing yeah so try to type this in and see if it gives you uh, this result here yeah just the clean verbs that's what you want yeah if that works congratulations we're almost there yeah so we have created a list of only the verbs and uh, not the to and the adverb and uh, now all we need to do is find out the frequencies of these elements which is perhaps something that you already know how to do in Excel but in case you don't uh, here's how it's done yeah in the data or donné uh, menu item 
there is an option that says uh, synthesize with a cross table, a dynamic cross table. And uh, I'd ask you to click on that, <clears throat> which will bring up a window that looks kind of scary. Yeah, it looks like this. It has a uh, search term up here and you need to drag this. You can click on it and drag it to the uh, lines, the, the rows and to the values. Okay. <clears throat> if you're doing this in another spreadsheet software, there is an option that allows you this kind of operation. It will just look a tiny bit different. Yeah. Uh, right. So once you do that, the table on the left hand side will transform in such a way that every verb is listed along with the number of times that it actually appears in the list that we looked at earlier. Yeah? So here, for example, we have um, several instances of uh, take and of get, and that will show up here. So for example, we have four instances of attack here. Right, so we're almost there. Yeah. So what I would like you to do now is to highlight this uh, list together with the frequencies and to copy it into yet another sheet in your spreadsheet software so that you have all the verbs in alphabetical order together with the construction frequency. So this is how often we find acquire in the split infinitive, how often we find admit, how often we find attack and so on and so forth. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> this means that we have taken care of the red cell of the contingency table. Yeah. So for all the verbs in the split infinitive construction, we now know how often we find it inside the split infinitive. That's not bad, yeah? That's uh, already something of an accomplishment. And that means that we've officially completed step two in our journey uh, towards a complete colostructional analysis. Good work, everyone. Okay, you ready to move on to step three? <clears throat> Which is actually the most complicated one for this kind of operation. We need to identify the overall corpus frequencies of all the lexical collocates that uh, we have been working with so far. So let's do that. Let's determine the corpus frequencies for all verbs. Um, now, that would be the green cell, right? So how often does acquire occur in our corpus files. How often do we find admit? How often do we find effect, aim, and so on and so forth? Right, how do we do that? Well, one thing that you could do is just to copy uh, the verb acquire in the infinitive form, put that into the search window of AntConc, hit search, and then take down the number manually and put it in that cell there. That's possible. Yeah, but it will also take a long time and we are lazy and don't have enough time. So what do we do? Well, um, we can use the advanced search option that AntConc uh, gives us. Okay, so if you go back to AntConc, uh, this is the concordance just as we left it and you click on this little advanced button here. <clears throat> yeah. When I told you to watch the video on the advanced features of AntConc, you were like, yeah, well, we're never going to use this. This is not useful at all. Well, how you like me now? Um, so here we have advanced. You click on that and uh, this window pops up. <clears throat> and uh, you see this window where it says use search terms from list below. This is what we want to use it. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is it. Uh, so I want you to activate that and I want you to copy and paste all the verbs yeah, with the infinitive tag from the Excel sheet. Copy and paste that into that window. Um, so we're going back to Excel. We highlight all the verbs starting with acquire and I think the last thing is zero. Um, and we copy and paste that into the uh, window here 
And it should look like this. You see only the first five, acquire, admit, effect, aim, alert. Um, important, activate this thing and hit apply. And then in principle, we're ready to uh, search for all of these verbs. And fair warning, this is going to take a long time. Yeah, because, well, we have lots of verbs, a big corpus, and between those two variables, well, AntConc is going to be busy for a while. So now might be a good time to make a cup of coffee or, well, depending on what time of day it is, grab a beer or watch some Netflix. I don't know what you're doing, but um, that's what I would do. Yeah. Okay, so you hit start. And your concordance after a while should look something like this. Yeah? Lots of acquire examples. Acquire is the first verb alphabetically in our concordance. And uh, up here you see a number that is quite ridiculously large. Yeah? So more than 100,000 uh, concordance lines in this concordance. And again, we want to save those results. Okay, So again, under File, save results, save this uh, somewhere on your computer where you will find it and name it in such a way that you recognize the file. So I called mine all the verbs or something. Yeah. Okay, and once you're done with that, uh, you can copy and paste uh, those results into Excel, just as we did before with the small concordance. And again, make some nice headers with left context, uh, verb, right context, and file. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, your Excel spreadsheet should look a little bit like this. And I actually think you can figure out the next step on your own. Yeah. So how do you make a list, a frequency list of these verbs using Excel? We've been there just a couple of minutes ago and you wish you had paid more attention when we were. But uh, this is the beauty of YouTube. You know, you can just go a little bit back. Um, but actually, you know, here we are. Let's just do this together. So you highlight the column, you can synthesize with a cross table, and you just make another table. <clears throat> it looks like this, except just like the old one, except now we have much larger frequencies. Yeah, so for acquire 178, for admit 359, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay, we're almost there, except we now need to highlight the verbs and the frequencies and copy and paste that to the earlier table that we made with the construction frequencies. Yeah. So we want to have the same verbs lining up. Yeah. And uh, we want to have one column for the construction frequencies, how often we find acquire in the split infinitive. And then next to that, we want to have the corpus frequencies, how often we find acquire in the corpus. Yeah? So 178, uh, 1, 359, and so on and so forth. So one thing, uh, you need to make sure that these verbs actually line up. Sometimes they don't. Yeah, Things go wrong in corpus linguistics and uh, they do so more often than uh, you would think. So uh, here though, things should line up rather nicely. Uh, if yours don't, then uh, use the sample file, the, the Excel spreadsheet file that you can download from the descriptions below. Okay. Um, Right, so this is what things should look like uh, once you've cleaned it up a little bit. The verbs, the construction frequencies, and the corpus frequencies of the verbs. And that is uh, the successful completion of our second step. We now have the construction frequencies, the red cell, and we have all the values for the green cell. And you might think, oh my god, we're only half done. We have two cells out of four that we need. But the good news is, these two cells are actually very, very easy when compared to the first two. Okay, so let's celebrate for a moment the successful completion of step three. We've identified 
the overall corpus frequencies of the lexical collocates. And now all that's left to do really is uh, step four, where we run the stats, and step five, where we look at things and uh, reflect on them. All right, so let's get to work on step four. What is happening in step four? Um, now, let's take another look at the uh, contingency table here. We still need to work on the blue cell and the purple cell. And you remember that uh, we had some 302 examples of the split infinitive. Yeah? So this cell corresponds to the question, how often do we find the construction? So that means that this number is actually going to be the same for all the uh, verbs that we have here. Okay, so you can actually add up uh, column B to check if that's true. Yeah? So if you do a sum function on, on that, it should add up to exactly 302. So acquire is one example out of 302. Appreciate three examples out of 302. Right, so that was easy, right? Um, but we still need to figure out how many constructions there are in the corpus. And then, as I said earlier, this has confused uh, minds of all kinds, uh, but we won't be confused. Uh, we will just look for all infinitives in the corpus that we're using. And I've done that here using the uh, regex option and uh, the tag for infinitives infinitives that are lexical verbs, by the way. So there are special infinitive tags for the verbs be, have, do, um, So and, and modal verbs, uh, but modal verbs don't have infinitives, so that's fine. <clears throat> so that's what we're searching for. And again, this will take a while because as you see here, we have uh, about 281,000 examples of infinitives in our corpus. That's a lot. Yeah, and that number is going to be the number that we put into the fourth cell, the, the, the purple cell that we need. Yeah, okay, so that's what we have here, and that means we're pretty much done. Okay, so we have all the information that we need in our contingency table to compute a collocation measure. If we now take the contingency table and plug in the actual numbers yeah, for, let's say, the verb attack. Yeah, if we wanted to compute collocational strength of attack in the split infinitive, we would take the number of uh, instances of attack in the split infinitive. We have four of them. Um, there are 182 instances of the verb attack in the corpus as a whole. There are 302 examples of the split infinitive in the corpus, and uh, we have 280,000 infinitives in total in the corpus. Right, and from those, through subtraction, we can arrive at the remaining cells in the table, and now we can use any uh, collocation statistic that we would like to use on this. Um, before we do, however, we need to go back just quickly to expected and observed frequencies. So here we have the observed frequencies. Let's just quickly check the expected frequencies for attack in the split infinitive. You might say, well, four, that's not much, right? Four examples. Are those more than expected or are those fewer than expected? <clears throat> we can actually figure this out. Uh, you remember that we had a formula for expected frequencies where we multiply the uh, marginal frequencies of word one and word two and divide that by the overall number of words in the corpus. We can do the same thing here for the marginal frequencies of the word and the construction. So we multiply uh, the green with the blue and divide that by the purple. So that would mean that we have uh, 182 times 302 divided by 280,000. And you can already see, I mean, uh, just by eyeballing the numbers, you can see that, well, there's probably going to be a small 
number, a small value that comes out of that. And indeed, the expected frequency of attack in the split infinitive is 0 0.2. So not even one example would we expect by chance of attack in the split infinitive. In earlier videos, I talked about collocation measures such as mutual information, the t-score, the z-score, or log likelihood. There is one statistic that is often used for colostructional analysis, and that is Fisher's exact test. Fisher's exact test is particularly useful for this kind of analysis because in colostructional analysis, we often deal with very low frequencies. Yeah? So the collocates of a construction will always involve many that occur only once or twice. Yeah, so when you look at the be going to construction in an English corpus, well, many verbs occur only once or twice with that construction. In our concordance of the split infinitive, most verbs actually occur just once. Okay, So you need a test that can deal with these low frequencies, and Fischer's exact can do that rather well. However, it's also fiendishly difficult to implement in an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, there is statistical software where you just call a function and that's that. But for our purposes, I've actually chosen to use a collocation uh, statistic that you're actually already familiar with, namely the log likelihood statistic. So if you go to the spreadsheet that comes with this presentation and open it up uh, where it says call analysis, um, it should look a little bit like this. Okay, so we have a first column with the verb, acquire, admit, affect, and so on and so forth. The second column has the frequency of the word in the construction. The third column has the frequency of the word in the corpus. So we have 178 instances of acquire in the corpus. Uh, we find 302 split infinitives in the corpus and 280,000 infinitives in the corpus. And from that, we can uh, calculate the expected frequency. Yeah? And we can calculate whether the observed frequency is higher or lower than the expected frequency. Yeah? And if we find more, example than, more examples than we would expect, uh, this means that the verb is attracted to the construction. In the very last column, we have a log likelihood value that tells us how strongly the verb is attracted to the construction. And uh, for acquire, we have 1.69, which is really not much. Uh, for alert, that is already a little bit higher because alert is not that frequent. Yeah? So it occurs only 26 times in the corpus as opposed to 178 for acquire. But if we go down the list, we see, well, here there's a really high log likelihood uh, value, 16.4, and that is the verb attack. Okay, So four examples out of 182, um, occur in the split infinitive and uh, we expected only 0.2 times that's what we calculated earlier so the observed frequency is a lot higher than the expected frequency and hence the high log likelihood value okay so I would encourage you to look at this list uh, a little bit look at the individual words uh, check out also those verbs that are repelled yeah we don't just have um <clears throat> attracted verbs we also have repelled verbs so the verb change occurs once but it occurs so often that we would actually expect it to occur more often than that yeah and there are others that behave in the same way right so with this, I think we can declare victory on point four. We have applied a statistical test that tells us which lexical elements are surprisingly frequent or surprisingly infrequent. And so all that would be left to do is um, take a good look at that table and uh, see if we can figure out whether the most strongly attracted verbs have something in common that allows us to describe the split infinitive construction. Yeah? And that's where I want this video to end. Uh, however, not without pointing out a terrible, terrible problem 
Namely, if we look at our concordance, there are some examples in there that clearly don't belong, that shouldn't be there. So for example, let's look at example number four. Yeah? To go to all square. Square is tagged as a verb in the infinitive, and God only knows why that happened. Okay, It's not a verb. Go to all square. Um, I wouldn't know how to parse that, yeah, but um, clearly it's not a verb in the infinitive. Or if we go down to uh, what looks like example 15, rail expects to double passenger mileage. To double passenger mileage. Passenger is uh, tagged as a verb in the infinitive. Double is tagged as an adverb, but both of these tags are clearly wrong, okay? So to double, well, uh, double is the verb here, and passenger mileage is actually a compound. This means that we're in trouble, right? Because we've calculated uh, values for elements that clearly shouldn't be there in the first place. Oh my God, have we just wasted 50 minutes of our lives? We, we didn't. No, it's fine. It's fine. So here's your homework assignment because your homework assignment is to fix this. Yeah. So your homework assignment would be uh, to find and throw out all the examples in the concordance that were mistagged in the corpus data. So there you need to go through the concordance line by line by line, look at it and decide for yourself, is this a good example or is this not such a good example? And uh, from there, well, you need to retrace some of the steps that were described in this video. You need to correct the frequencies, the word and construction frequencies, the word and corpus frequencies, the uh, construction frequencies. So if we throw out a couple uh, examples from the concordance, it will no longer be 302. It will be less than that. Okay. Um, once you've done that, yeah, you can uh, take a look at the remaining verbs and their log likelihood values and you can identify the verbs that remain and that are most strongly attracted to the split infinitive. You can also do the opposite and look at the verbs that are most strongly repelled by the split infinitive and that will complete step number five. So in that sense that's when you will have done and completed a colostructional analysis all on your own. And that's great. Okay, uh, if you've made it through this video up to this point, congratulations. Uh, this is not trivial stuff, yeah? So this is really uh, difficult and it involves a lot of different steps. So yeah, I'm glad you made it to this point. Um, that's it for this video. Have a good week and I'll see you next time.